you love being private. Why? You know, we're enjoying the freedom and uh, flexibility we have as a private company. We are not bound by 90-day periods. We're focusing on our future out, you know, several years from now. And, uh, you know, we have uh, an enormous opportunity. And we've had a great year. We're growing our, all of our businesses. All of our businesses are performing quite well relative to the industry. And uh, it's just a lot easier to focus 100% on our customers and um, not have to worry about the investors. There you go. Is it that different being private versus being public? You've had it for a year now. I think about 20% of my time has been freed up. Really? Yeah. 20% of a CEO's time. It's pretty remarkable. Well, you think about all of the time spent dealing with gov governance and preparing for uh, you know, investor activities and dealing with uh, you know, various shareholder requests. I mean, if I watch your show, I see a constant discussion of should there be a bigger dividend? Should there be a share repurchase? Should they spin off this? Should they split off that? Should they merge with this? This is really, uh, uh, you know, can be quite distracting, right? If you're trying to grow a business, right? So. Well, that leads us to a pretty obvious question, which is you partnered with Silver Lake. There are lots of other private equity firms that have tons of capital and great access to financing who could partner with other public companies. Should more public companies go private? Well, that's for them to decide. I, I've had quite a few of them uh, contact me and ask me about, you know, how we went through the process and what it was like and, and that sort of thing. It, it certainly wasn't an easy thing uh, to go through the process. Once we've got through it, it it's, it's been a lot easier managing the business as a, as a private entity. We can take on risk. You know, we can accept risks and uh, invest uh, more aggressively. And it's, uh, uh, you know, I, I, I think you, you, you could see some more based on the discussions that I've been having with, with some other, other colleagues. You have intrigued me. How many companies are, I'm curious if you could put a little detail on it, how many companies have you talked to about doing the kind of transaction that you did? And are we talking about companies of the size of Dell, $27 billion bat or even larger? Uh, some some in Dell's uh, size range, some a little larger, uh, you know, quite a lot, a lot more smaller than than Dell, uh, but you know, let's say more than ten. But you know, obviously, I can't can't tell you who they are. Do you blame activism? You know, let's put it this way: you tangled with Carl Icahn and Southeastern in the course of taking Dell private, and that has given you a taste of activism. Do you blame activism for what's happening? to some of your competitors, HP, for example, splitting into IBM under tremendous pressure from investors for not being able to grow revenue and perhaps doing the wrong things with its capital? I think there are two lenses that you know, one should apply to these various moves that are being made. And the first is to say, you know, is, is this something that's actually good for the customers of the enterprise? And often cases, the answer is no. And then the second lens question would be, if you owned all of the business, would you actually do this? And of course, there's, there, you know, activism is, is a bull market strategy. And there's a risk that uh, you know, the, the temporary nature of that shareholder who's renting those shares for a period of time, uh, you know, it, it certainly benefits during that, that short period of time. But what happens later on? And that's a, that's a risk. And certainly as a, as a long-term uh, you know, owner-operator of a business, I, I'm thinking about this over, over you know, a lifetime and beyond. So what do you say to the growing number of public company directors who are popping up, and occasionally even members of management, though are, there are far fewer of those who say, activism is a, is a healthy influence on corporate America. It's bringing discipline to management. Is that totally disingenuous? Well, I, I'm not saying it's all bad, and I'm sure there are, are, are good ones, and I'm sure there have been plenty of good things that have happened a, a, as a result of it. But anything taken to an extreme, you know, can, can be a bad thing, right? And, and 
you know, I think I think there are some mm-hmm. some some bad examples in addition to probably some some good ones. John Phelan, who manages your money, whom I met last year, told me at the time that you could have financed your LBO on your own without Silver Lake. Should you have, in retrospect? Well, the the nature of the process really lent itself to uh, uh, in, ensuring that there was another party involved, you know, uh, you know, beyond me and and. Uh, you know, the independent board of directors went through this very rigorous process. There were actually uh, multiple go shops, as you recall. You guys reported on quite extensively, and, and I think it was about the most rigorous process ever ever conducted. Uh, and it was, was, in revenue terms, the largest company ever to go private. Let's talk about the business. How quickly is your industry growing, the markets you serve, and how is Dell doing against that? We've been able to accelerate our growth rate, and we've been investing. You know, we've had seven quarters now in a row of share gain. And here in the United States in the last quarter in our client business, we grew 19.7%. The total industry grew only 47 But if you take Dell out of the total industry, the rest of the industry grew only 02 So 197 for Dell, 02 for the rest of the industry. All of our businesses are growing and profitable. We're investing in R&D. We're adding new customers. And so, you know, today we are uh, the fastest growing large integrated IT company in the world. So we've materially increased our investments and our growth. When you say 19% for the client business, what exactly does that mean and how does that compare to overall top line growth? Yeah, that's the, that's the IDC data. Uh, you know that that's released by them publicly uh, you know, for unit uh, sales. Revenue would be a little different than that. Um, you know that's that's not the total business. That's a that's a part of our business. But we we we've we've been able to you know pretty much across the board uh, grow the business uh, you know faster than the industry. So these days that would be low mid single digits. Not, not, not providing uh, that kind of that kind of. Well, how you know, about that's, that? That's one of the beauties of being private. <laughs> being private. Is I don't have to answer that question. But, <laughs> but, 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 look, I can tell you, you know, we're generating healthy cash flows. We're, you know, paying down debt aggressively. You know, business has, has got a very healthy rhythm to it, and uh, you know, year the year's gone very well. How about costs? Where are you on operating margins? Operating margins are, are are pretty healthy. You know, we're 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 uh, you know operating in a in a comfortable zone, and we're able to reinvest in the business. Uh, but again, not not. Uh, the reason I ask, of course, is that's one of the things that you have an opportunity to do as a private company that's perhaps easier than when you're a public company, given all the scrutiny that comes uh, from investors and from the media and from government when it comes to effectively cutting jobs. You're a growing company, but are you becoming more efficient? We're becoming more efficient, more productive. We are adding headcount in research and development and in sales uh, because, you know, these, this is a growth business and there certainly are plenty of areas where there's expansion opportunity for us. You know, think about, uh, you know, the next billion customers that are being, you know, added, you know, uh, in, into the digital, you know, age. Uh, we have a pretty dramatic expansion of capabilities in cloud and cybersecurity. We have a fast-growing uh, security business, our software business, our data center business. Uh, we just introduced our 13th generation of our PowerEdge servers. The business, uh, you know, is presently growing at a double-digit growth rate. So we're absolutely gaining share. I look at our, uh, you know, key competitors, you know, in the negative growth rate. So their you know, numbers are public. Their numbers are public. <laughs> we can see that, and and uh, you know it's fun to be a little stealthier. We can we can, uh, uh, you know, uh, but look the 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 business is is doing well. Most importantly, our our customers are happy. You know, we had a great event a few weeks ago, Dell World. We had five thousand customers there, uh, many of them showing off what they're doing with our technology to drive innovations and success in their businesses and. We've focused all of our energy in our business on how do we make our customers successful. We do that, you know, our customers win, company wins. M- Michael, the whole industry, I think it's fair to say, was surprised by the demand for 
PCs over the past year. Maybe you weren't, but it seems everybody else was. Uh, how much of that was due to the refresh cycle, and how far along is that cycle right now? It was certainly a, a, a big factor, and uh, you know there are 1.8 billion PCs uh, out there in the world. About 380 million of them sold you know, in the past year, uh, but you've got uh, over 650 million PCs that are four years old or older, and this is a fairly predictable thing, right? This isn't new inf new information. This was this, this is information that's been known for years. Not a question of what, but when. Exactly. So what happens is at some point in time, a new product comes along that is significantly better than the one you already have, and you say, I've got to have that. It's thinner, lighter, faster, does amazing things as a touchscreen, high resolution, whatever it may be, and you get that replacement. And certainly it's, it's occurred you know, this past year. Uh, we're going into a replacement cycle in servers with Windows Server 2003, uh, and you know, there are millions of servers that have to be replaced. And we're just at the beginning of that cycle, gearing up for that from a consulting and services standpoint, from a product standpoint. And we've got the whole product line refreshed and ready to go to, to, to go help customers address that. Is that going to be more meaningful from a revenue and profitability standpoint than the PC refresh cycle has been? Well, this is another one of these questions I don't have to answer. <laughs> you know, so. True, but it's just characterizing this. I'm not asking you for numbers. Yeah, look, I, I, think, I think it's, it's certainly... I, the uh, reason I ask is because it seems to be one of those things that perhaps not everybody has figured out. If the PC, the speed of the PC refresh cycle took people by surprise, mm -hmm. I wonder whether they're going to be taken by surprise by the refresh cycle in servers and whether you think that that's the case. In other words, is your view, do you see, do you believe your view is different from the prevailing view? I think our view certainly was different in, in, the, in, the, in the belief in the PC. And, and by the way, we include tablets in, in mm -hmm. PC. We, we just think of that as a, it's a, you know, it's a notebook without a keyboard. Right. That's, that's, that's a tablet. So we see growth uh, continuing. And by the way, our, our perspective here is the market grows, we grow. The market shrinks, we grow. So we're growing share, and and so you know uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, the 19.7 percent we grew 310 basis points of share in the United States. You know, big big market for us for sure, and you know been growing share seven quarters in a row. We want to continue to do that in all of our businesses. So you have a great installed base in servers, and that should benefit you. Number one in North America, number one in APJ, and uh, we've refreshed the product line, you know, tons of innovation and R&D applied to really you know, lead in that space. And also workloads are moving off of mainframe and Unix and you know, sort of older traditional environments onto more open uh, software-defined kind of environment. So we're extremely well positioned uh, in, in the data center. What about the enterprise markets where you don't have that kind of installed base? Virtualization, for example, and the public cloud. Many of the companies active in those markets, Facebook, Amazon, Google, Yahoo, the list goes on, aren't buying brand name servers, right? They're effectively buying white boxes or companies, servers from companies like WeWin or Quanta, and putting their own customized software on those boxes. How do you compete with that trend, which is very powerful? Well, the, the, the virtualization trend, that's been going on for 15 sure. years, and we're, we're a big part of that. There are about four companies, and you, you referred to them, that like to kind of roll their own, if you will, right, in terms of, of the, 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 the data center. We still sell relatively substantial amounts of product to those companies for a variety of reasons. When you get beyond those companies, uh, you don't see as much of this. And you also have to understand there's a really long tail on the de provision and deployment of computing power. There are 600 telcos out there in the world that are all building their own clouds. And as a provider of infrastructure to all these companies, we tell them, first of all, 
we're not your competitor, right? So, so we're not we're out there building a, a public cloud. So we're providing infrastructure to a very high percentage of, of these companies, including many of the ones that, that you mentioned, helping them stand up their their cloud capabilities. And of course, uh, you know, you have eighty five percent of the you know market is is not is not you know the those companies and and so uh, you know we're selling uh, you know roughly a third of the of the servers out there we know where they're all going and the ship to addresses would uh, amaze you at how dispersed it is there's still an enormous number of small sites and small data centers and while there's growth in the cloud you know we're actively uh, fueling a, a, you know a lot of that so as as all these software as a service companies are building up, we're often the power behind them in helping them, you know, build build their new capability. So, New Relic, for example, you know, hot new company, you know, go, go, you know, getting ready to go public here. Great example of a Dell customer. You know, many many more as as these companies stand up. Uh, Dropbox, you know, uh, Dropbox is a you know great great Dell customer. As they need more capacity, they're they're buying that from Dell. What's the outlook for margins in the industry, not just for your business, when on the one hand you have those sort of non-name brand companies selling at very low ISPs, ASPs, excuse me, and at the same time you have name brand competitors like Cisco who are kind of commoditizing the business or trying to? I think you have to have a very efficient supply chain. You've got to be relentless on cost, and it's an operational excellence uh, you know, business for sure. And you've got to keep moving up the food chain in terms of, you know, value add and software and services. And you feel prepared for it. Well, we're we're doing well. We we we've had a great year. We're absolutely energized to go do that. And we bought 40 companies in the last five or six years. Uh, so we added tremendous IP. We've got the 15th largest software company in the world. Grew over 20 percent last quarter. Uh, so you know we're 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 off we're off and running. Microsoft has been a good partner of yours and a good partner of HP's over the years. Mm -hmm. What if they move their Azure server business to non-branded boxes? What we see is is the the, the model that uh, is conventional wisdom is that you know the public cloud grows and and everything else shrinks. I actually think that something a little different is happening. There, you know. What is the public cloud? People don't actually want the public cloud or the cloud. They want the benefits of the cloud. Okay. What is it? Well, it's it's software that allows you to get better utilization over this shared pool of resources. Now, what's actually happening is you're starting to see a new breed of software in these private data centers that's making them much more efficient. And that efficiency over time is approaching the efficiency of the public cloud. So if you go out there and you talk to, you know, uh, a company, 500 person, 1,000 person, 20,000 person company, and you say, hey, you know, uh, what do you like about the cloud? Well, I like this efficiency. I like the cost. What do you not like about it? Well, I'm worried about security. I'm worried about you know my my data being stolen and you know the, the, the risk associated with that. So we're seeing real growth in the private cloud, and you're seeing a lot of energy mm -hmm. being applied by Microsoft and VMware, Red Hat, you know, number of new companies uh, that, that you know we're partnered with private enterprises to do the kinds of things exactly. that the private cloud, the public cloud offers. These sound like some pretty powerful trends. If you look into the future, what do you see as the most disruptive technologies, the things that are going to change our lives as consumers, the, thing that are, the things that are going to change the course of history for companies? Look, we've got silicon costs are coming down dramatically, and, and that is creating you know, not a billion devices, but a trillion devices. And that's enabling all kinds of new business model disruption beyond technology disruption. If you think about Uber and B Airbnb, these aren't really technology innovations as much as they are business model disruptions driven by the availability of technology and at low the, cost. The, and, and, and the low cost. That's going to continue and only accelerate. And then, of course, as you have 
you know, go from a billion to a trillion devices, you have enormous amounts of data. Well, that data has to be analyzed and interpreted, and you have to do something with it, and then you can, you know, uh, enhance all kinds of businesses for better outcomes, and not just businesses, but, you know, uh, healthcare, education, the environment, energy, et cetera. So th there's just an enormous um, amount of opportunity in, in, in our sector, and it's becoming uh, much more important. You know, it used to be it was just the big companies. It was very expensive. Now it's every company. You can't do anything without technology. Small businesses, uh, they're, they're able to go global much more rapidly, and so the pie is expanding uh, pretty significantly in, in our sector. And look, there's only, there are only about 10 companies on the planet that have uh, you know, more than 1% of this $3 trillion uh, market. You know, we happen to have about 2% of it. So you know, we'd like to have three or four. We'll, we'll keep working on it. Um, one last thing. Five years from now, what does Dell look like? We've built a pretty substantial enterprise solutions business, you know, in, in the last five years. We'd like to double it again, so that would take it to, you know, 40, 40 plus billion or so. Uh, you know, and we're, we're, we're absolutely building a, a capability to serve uh, a, a broader set of customer needs. So we started as a product company, moving much more into services and solutions and helping our customers solve the, the, the real business problems uh, that, that uh, they have. It's been a pleasure talking to you. Thank you Thank so you. much. Thank you.